What's up, Familia? Dayspring here with an episode of Power of X-Men to discuss the latest issue of Immortal X-Men, issue number 17, where our God Queen and the Phoenix and Hope Summers so much happens. Mm, I got a glass of wine because I'm ready to talk and rant about it. Before we begin, Familia, please hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell so you never miss an episode of Power of X-Men. So I've been sitting with this issue all day because I I like it. I want to say I really do like this issue of Immortal X-Men. I like where they're going with Gene and the Phoenix, but I have very complicated feels about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired because I just got back from F1 in Vegas, which was so much fun. And, you know, we're moving back to New York. So we just had to do some setup with the new pad there. And today was my little guy's. It would have been my little guy's 18th birthday, and he and he passed away about three and a half years ago. So I've been, you know, I've been kind of in my feels and in my head all day. So I wanted to wait until I was a little bit more level-headed to discuss these these feelings that I had for Gene and the Phoenix and Hope, because they are really complicated. And I want to say that I'm really happy that finally we're getting some movement with the X office with everything concerning Gene and the Phoenix. I will say it's a lot of whiplash for us Gene stands who have been around since the late eighties, early nineties, because, you know, when Gene came back following the events of dark Phoenix, when she came back in X factor, we were told that Gene and the Phoenix were two very separate beings. And during Inferno, the Phoenix gave itself to, to Gene. So she had the memories of dark Phoenix and as well as Madeline, because she dwelled inside of Madeline as well. And that was it. For all intents and purposes, though, the Phoenix was just a, a clone of Jean, and now she just has the memories of Dark Phoenix. And, you know, we, we, we got little hints that the Phoenix was coming back to Jean around the 12 when she started wearing the green Phoenix costume. But, you know, that was a story that sort of went nowhere. And then we got Grant Morrison's new X-Men, which firmly established that Jean and the Phoenix were one and the same. To the point that even in Here Comes Tomorrow, when the biblical beast, you know, possessed our beast, possessed by Sublime, was cloning genetic traits, he was able to clone Phoenix traits within him because the Gene and Phoenix bond was so strong that the Phoenix was manifesting itself within Gene's genetics. I mean, that talk about subtext there, you know, and a lot of people don't ever really talk about that. So Gene, at the end, is able to amputate that entire future, that entire timeline, and push Scott to be with Emma and, and saving the world as we know it. And I love that. Familia, Gene being able to rise above her human emotions in the White Hot Room and pushing Scott to be with Emma to save the universe chef's kiss i mean listen my favorite movie is interstellar so that 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 tells you two things one i love space intergalactic cosmic odysseys and two i believe in human emotion and love saving the day at the end of the at the end of the story so you know i to me that is so such a personally beautiful well-written story that speaks directly to my heart and then when we got phoenix and song when, it, it, this is a little complicated with phoenix and song and song was supposed to be the last gene gray story ever told to the point that even in chris claremont's uncanny issue that he was writing at the time he accidentally put in there a line that gene and the phoenix had separated and gene died for good because the phoenix had severed itself from gene so Phoenix and Song, what ended up happening is they 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 shipped issue one and it was number one on the sales charts back when we could see sales figures. It was insane numbers. I want to say it was something like 90 to 100K shipping. And it was number one for the month. And Marvel was like, oh, there's a lot of life in this Jean Grey IP. So maybe it's not a good idea if we just kill her off for, for good. So Phoenix and Song ends on this very beautiful note that Jean is going to go back into the White Hot Room to find all of her missing pieces. And the answer to Jean finding her missing pieces was supposed to be Hope. As we ranted countless times on this podcast, Hope eventually became her own character. And by the way, if you would have asked me like two, three years ago, I would have been like, I really wish that Hope had been Jean Grey reborn. And somehow, you know, our real Jean can come back through the Hope character. But after reading Immortal X-Men today, I am very happy that Hope has 
been her own character. By the way, in general, in the Krakoan age, I want to I want to give props to the editorial team and the writers for developing Hope. I really do like Hope as the leader of the five and that the secret to mutant resurrection lies within her because she is a mutant messiah. I love it so incredibly much. But when Jean finally came back at the end of Phoenix Resurrection, we didn't really get any answers to where Jean had been all that time since she had died. It it, it sounds like because we got X-Men read the annual, which if I remember correctly from my interview with Matt Rosenberg, we interviewed Matt Rosenberg like a year and a half ago. Go please check out that interview. But when we spoke with Matt Rosenberg, I believe he said that he was supposed to write the X-Men Red Annual, but then he gave it to Tom Taylor to write because Tom was writing X-Men Red at the time and he thought that was only right. Matt Rosenberg, let me tell you, what a great dude. Loved having him on the podcast. Please go re- listen to that interview. I was about to say go read. <laughs> We're a podcast and, and a YouTube page. But go watch or listen to that interview that we did with Matt Rosenberg. Because he talks about how originally X-Men Disassemble was supposed to end at three very different endings. And Phoenix Resurrection was going to end very differently as well. So go go please check out those interviews. But what I'm trying to say with this is I think there was a lot of confusion behind the scenes as to where Jean was in those years that she had died. And now all of a sudden editorial really wants to go back to this notion that Gene and Phoenix are one and the same, which again, this is something that has been established at this point for almost 20 years. If you've been reading any Gene, you know, stories, we knew Gene and the Phoenix were one and the same. And Phoenix and Song back in 2005, the Phoenix says, so this longing I have for this world, it, it, it's yours because you and I are one. And even in the Jean Grey series, we get that Jean is a phoenix, is, is Jean Grey. So I don't know why we had to get a one shot of Axe Judgment Day where Jean is basically told that she is the phoenix and that she will always be the phoenix. This we know. I don't know why we had to have an entire mini series written by Louise Simonson, which is very good. It is a very well written series. She tackles Jean's personality and voice very well, but it, it was an entire mini series just to establish that Jean and the phoenix are now bonded. And this this also raises questions for me, which is Jean has died before in the House of X era. Did the Phoenix always try to come and save her? Why is the Phoenix coming now to her? This was also the question we had in Phoenix Resurrection. Why did the Phoenix, after Jean being dead for so long, why did the Phoenix just now randomly decide to resurrect her? I would... I've always said I would have loved if the gap would have been like because something big is coming. And it could have been this. It could have been the Krakoan Massacre. It could have been something of that nature. But it's never really been truly answered. Just like why is the Phoenix now coming to Jean when she's died a couple of times already in the Krakoan age? And so those are questions I still have following a lot of the stuff that's going on. But I think what we're seeing here, and I'm going to give the editorial team some props, I think we're seeing a larger Gene Phoenix story being built here. And they're taking their time, and they're reintroducing this concept to new readers. Again, I, my main qualm in general with Marvel is, why are they always trying to capture new readers? Why don't they build upon the stories that they have already established and, and try to maintain the interest of current comic book readers? And you know, I have been a Wednesday warrior since Grant Morrison, you know, back in 2002, 2003. I mean, I had been reading the books, obviously, before that. I had left during, like, the Zero Tolerance era right after right after Onslaught. So, Grant Morrison, they brought me back to the comics, but they didn't only bring me back. Now, I was a college student with my own disposable income and a car, so I went to the comic book store every Wednesday, and I've been doing that up until probably Inferno, you know, this Inferno, the, the Hickman one, I'm like, I don't know why I'm pointing here, this Inferno, the one right next to me, no, but the Inferno and 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 Trial of Magneto, that's where I was like, mm, maybe I can wait for things to be on the Marvel Unlimited app. And I got to tell you, with Comixology going away, I'm like, oh man, I have to now read stuff on my Kindle. I know I know the Kindle app. I was talking to Pat Loic about this. The Kindle app is basically... It, it, it's basically the same as Comixology. Comixology is just a reskinned Kindle app. But there's something I like having my books separate and I like clicking on the Comixology. I'm sure I will adapt. But I remember thinking, like, man, 
th th these are some extra legs, extra steps I have to go through just to get my comics when I read digital comics for space and 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 time because I'm always on the road. I don't always have the time to go into a comic book store every Wednesday. But now I'm like, mm, since I'm not going to, you know, I'm not buying these comics every Wednesday since you know, my my interest in, in this year is kind of like falter. I'm like, I wish they would just try to capture, keep my attention. But I will tell you, this has definitely caught my attention. And I kind of want to break down some of the stuff that we found out in Immortal X-Men number 17 and stuff I wish that had been planted before. Because one of the big questions I'm going to have here is about Exodus. And if Exodus is this religious zealot who has always had faith in hope and hope being the mutant messiah... It really does sound here that Jean would be the deity overseeing all of Krakoa and why why we haven't seen Exodus sort of worship her like that as well. So let's dive into some of the blurbs, some of the things we got here. We got a lot of homages, especially to Ensong in this issue, and I'm so happy to go through it with you all. Okay, so the opening data page is a quote from the Book of Apocalypse translated by Exodus. And it says, quote, they who have an ear, let them hear what Jean Grey declared to the people. She said that those who believe would not suffer a final death. Okay. I I would have loved to have seen Jean say this. I'm just saying, I, Jean during the Krakoan age, I thought was a bit stagnant. Her saying something like this, becoming a religious figure. I mean, instead of like founding the Phoenix Foundation, which I thought was abs absolutely ridiculous and just complicated the world building for Krakoa even more. I wish they would have just shown her on a mount or that first time when she got resurrected saying those who believe will not suffer a final death. I I would love that. Following her first death in House of X, she would have said that. The quote goes on, but to hope, the angel in Krakoa, she sent thoughts. I offer you a sharp two-edged sword. I am the house where you dwell. Even beside Apocalypse's throne, I see you. You will hold fast in my name. You will not deny faith in me. Even in the days of all the futures past and futures to come, my faithful one who will be killed in my name where apocalypse dwells. The religious imagery is right there in your face. I love that hope is sort of seen as an archangel of the phoenix. I love that so much. Amelia, I cannot tell you. If hope was not going to be Jean Grey reborn, hope being an archangel of the phoenix gets me so excited. I love it so much. It, it, it reminds me of Battlestar Galactica, where Leoben tells Starbuck, I don't see Kara thrice anymore. I see an angel blazing with the light of God. An angel. I love that. I love it so much. So, I love that Hope is is this biblical archangel, and she is Jean's arm, her sword on Krakoa. But again, I will say this is certainly just a data page that is out of the blue. We have never seen any of this on Krakoa, especially pertaining to Jean. Obviously, in Immortal X-Men, we've had Exodus and Hope, and they're... Their, their relationship and Exodus being a firm believer and having faith and hope as a mutant messiah. Never once is Jean mentioned. So that had me kind of scratching my head because if Exodus, who is a religious fanatic in canon, knows this about, about Jean, why wasn't he worshiping Jean in the same vein? Or why wasn't this being mentioned before? I also... Saying that you will not suffer a final death, that means that Jean really much... I'm sorry, no, I'm like harping on this, but that means that Jean was not just dead those years, as it was said in X-Men Red Annual, where she said, I was a phoenix, I was burning bright until I wasn't. We've ranted about this to till the end of days. But anyways, so we open up this issue with with Xavier and Sinister, and they have their own thing going. And, you know, we're not going to dwell on it too much, but Xavier and Sinister, they reach an understanding, and we find out that Xavier is still infected with Sinister tampering from the days of the Black Womb Project, which was something that was very much touched upon in previous X-Men stories, specifically Endangered Species and the issues leading um, up to Legion Quest. And it involved a one Irene Atler as well, and Mr. Sinister, and Kane Marco, a.k.a. Juggernaut's father. So there, there is a lot of history there. But the other X-Men during the Sins of Sinister era storyline they're absolved of any sinister tampering they are 100 okay 
Xavier is able to see Sinister because of this tampering that happened in the Black Womb Project previously. And they have a very cute story where they sort of sit down and Xavier does not end his life. He sits down with Sinister and they reach and understand. It's all very cute. But the main part of the story is Apocalypse and Hope and Exodus fighting with Jean on the sidelines in a delirious state. This is post her mini series. So you're going to want to read the mini series first, issues one through four, and then pick up here in issue 17. It opens up saying the white hot room, nowhere, no when. And in it, the Jean's internal log- internal monologue says, Now and forever, I am Phoenix. Now and I thought I was dead, waiting to come together in the white hot room, incubating to be born anew, all in good time. But it's not time, is it? Yet here I am. Am I? Something's wrong. This is 100% the opening page from Phoenix and song i am so happy you have no idea how happy this is because i thought that opening page of phoenix and song was brilliant it was so epic the she are are reconstituting the phoenix they want revenge on the phoenix even though the phoenix is dead so why would you reconstitute it just to kill it again but you know whatever that's fine you know we'll we'll let shh, we'll let that go by but I love it because they're like, wait a minute, the Phoenix Raptor is manifesting without the host, the X-Men known as Jean Grey. They're like, how is the Phoenix even manifesting without her? That's impossible. And so the Phoenix is confused and goes back to Earth and it resurrects Jean Grey. And Jean's like, no, we're dead in the white hot room about to step into the door. Why aren't you with me? And the Phoenix is like, well, why aren't you with me? Again, it just... The groundwork for Gene and Phoenix being eternally bonded was already set 20 years ago. And that's why I love that opening issue of Phoenix and Song, specifically these words, because the Phoenix is lost without Gene Gray. They have a very interconnected relationship, and I love it so much. Anyways, so that's what's going on there. And Apocalypse is saying that... Is a Satan you believe him to be? He is here and I am he. I created for I, I am created from you. This is all created from you. And so Exodus and Apocalypse fight, and then hope becomes the phoenix and she says no longer am i the woman you knew i am life incarnate now and forever i am fire and life incarnate now and forever i am fire and life incarnate now and forever i love that being a chant for for phoenix warrior and she just decimates apocalypse she goes i am phoenix oh Beautiful. Remind me a lot of the X Men Apocalypse movie where where Sophie Turner, Jean Grey, it lets go and she goes ah, like that and just obliterates Apocalypse. It's perfect. It was perfect. I, I loved it in the movie, even though that was a deeply flawed movie. But I love that scene and I love this with Hope here. And then Hope says, "I could feel what you felt about me, and I was what you felt about me. It went in circles like an engine, like I was." Thank you. I couldn't have done it without you. I I love it. Again, I would just have like added a line here about how it felt different when she was White Phoenix in AVX. And I know I've gotten into a little bit of a tiff with some of you in comments because I said, well, Hope was White Phoenix during AVX. And some, some of you have been like, no, Gene is a White Phoenix of the crown. And I will just say, I, I agree. That, 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 that at the core of it, I agree that there is Jean as White Phoenix of the Crown and Hope just manifesting a phoenix and wearing a white costume does not make her a white phoenix. However, canonically, there is no evidence to suggest there is any difference. White phoenix outfit is supposed to mean total control of the host with the phoenix and that they're one and the same. That's what it's supposed to mean. I don't know if they'll ever tackle it. I agree at the core of it that Jean is White Phoenix of the Crown. No one can reach her level. And again, if you've been listening to some of the previous episodes, I love what Louise Simonson said. For me, this is true going forward. Anytime we're going to talk about Jean and the Phoenix, I will take Louise Simonson's words from this interview as canon. Even though it was just in an interview, it's not canon, but I will take it as such, which is the Phoenix is a creation of Jean. And anytime it manifests in any other people, it's just Jean Grey's will manifesting across the Marvel Universe. I love that so much. 
So we look at Jean and she's kind of confused. And she says, Jean is the house where I live. I am the house where Jean Grey lives. So Jean is the house where I live is from Grant Morrison's new X-Men when Xavier's like, Jean, let me talk to the Phoenix. That's where it is. Uh, and I am the house where Jean Grey lives. I think that is a line that was written specifically for this issue. The White Hot Room is where the Phoenix lives. Again, I think those two lines are specifically just written for this issue, and they're just trying to connect everything. You'll learn more about me uh, more in time, boys. That's from, I hope I wasn't too rough. That's all from, you know, when Jean first joined the X-Men. I can't screen out everyone's thoughts. Some of the images I'm receiving are so vile, but I can handle that. Part of me almost finds those thoughts attractive. That is from Dark Phoenix, obviously. So we're there with that. So Gene faints, and <laughs> I just realized what I said out loud. I hate that I just said that, that Gene faints. Gene is obviously tired because she is in the white hot room going through a lot of personal turmoil. And so she has to take a breather and hope an exodus take her to safety. Where Mother Righteous tells Destiny, Exodus and Hope are back. They found Jean Grey. Interesting, right? And Destiny says, Destiny says, it is, though curious. Jean Grey, here, she didn't escape the Hellfire Gala. She died. Hmm. Now, I just want to pull on that thread. Yeah, obviously she's in the White Hot Room because she died and she's a phoenix and the White Hot Room is a nexus for all phoenix hosts. That is 100% why she's there. But it does beg the question. So Jean has a body here. Typically in the past when we've seen Jean reborn, there is a, a phoenix egg situation. But as we saw in the Jean Grey series, you know, the Teen Jean series, not the Louis Simonson one, the Teen Jean series from a couple years ago, the phoenix can just bring Jean back, body and soul, boom, right there, as we saw at the end. So that's fine. They, Jean has a new body here in the White Hot Room. But yeah, I mean, she did not escape. For all intents and purposes, there is a corpse at the Hellfire Gala still there, Um or maybe Orcus got it to like examine it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's the world's most powerful mutant, and her body was there. I mean, I would take a look at it for genetic, you know, engineering if I was Orcus. But you know, let's, shh, let's not think too much about the plot here. Jean is in the in the White Hot Room. It's curious that Destiny is sort of aloof to that because I do think that they would be like the White Hot Room has come up before in X Men lore. Destiny and Mother Righteous don't need to know it, but Betsy did say in her resurrection issue, oh, but what will happen when Jean comes from the white hot room back for her man? Toodles. You know, so even Betsy knew about the white hot room. We know she had ties with it during House of M, but, you know, everyone's acting like they've never heard about the white hot room before. I think that is just my only qualm here, but that's fine. You know, someone like Destiny, I would have assumed would have known about the book of Exodus and all this stuff, but it's fine. It's this is my point with Krakoa. I think there's a lot of good stuff being thrown at the wall, but there's not a lot that's flushed out. And there's not a lot that we as readers can really tug on and try to see how things are interconnected. I think this larger story with Gene and the Phoenix and Hope and Exodus, we're starting to see come into fruition. I think it's going to carry on through X-Men forever. But again, it is curious that the White Hot Room is this big of a mystery to so many characters since, again, Hope and Generation Hope was in the White Hot Room. Betsy has mentioned the White Hot Room in the past. Emma, Scott, Magic, Colossus, Namor have all had the Phoenix. Scott went all the way up to the White Hot Room in the Uncanny X-Men AVX tie-in. It is curious to me that this is such a, a mystery to everyone, but especially to a character like Destiny, who sees all future, all pos possibilities, and should should have a good working knowledge of everything in the Marvel Universe. But I can let it go. I, I can let it go. It's not, not a hill I will die on. So um, Mother Righteous says, hmm, indeed, they know why. Let's get you ahead of the curve. And then Mother Righteous says, we're in the white hot room. No past, no future, no nothing. It's why your vision isn't working. But I've got to be honest. I'm more worried about what you may have seen. And Destiny is like, I am outside of time and space. It can't see me. And she says, stop, Mother Righteous. You're a sinister. Yes, you have to stop. You don't know what you're. And then she stabs Irene. And Irene says, please listen. 
And then Mother Righteous, I always want to say Mother Righteousness. Mother Righteous says, sorry, love, not in the mood for chatting. I need to finish you off. Hide the body so they can't bring you back. <laughs> Hide the body so they can't bring you back. But you don't need a body to be brought. Oh, well, I guess, okay, because they are they need the genetic sample because they're in the white hot room. So, you know, they, they, they could bring her back, you know, if they get to Krakoa and they get those sample, those DNA samples. Mm. So Mother Righteous is up to a lot. And then we get Hope and Exodus and Calm. You have done well, little Kafka. Oh, that's that's their name, Kafka. Oh, I love that. It's in our hands. Hi. And so a fight ensues. What got Krakoa angry? And Exodus is like, we shall not suffer mother righteous, a witch to live, which I love that line. That's hysterical. He's for better or for worse at times, he is a religious zealot. And so Mother Righteous really wanted Jean and gets Jean and walks her through the desert. So we get more quotes uh, from Phoenix and Song where so hard to think something's missing. It's not time yet. Is it cold dying? I'm never cold. And I can't die, can I? So there we go, Familia. Lots of homages to previous Jean stories from her original appearance to End Song. There's a quote in there also about X Factor, where she was here like, I can't believe you guys have let Xavier's dream die. So there's a lot of Jean work happening. I am glad our God Queen is 100% back in the White Hot Room in her own body. Why is she wearing that Hellfire Gala costume still? Oh, I hate that. I wonder if we're going to get Jean with a new costume. I would love to see Jean in a new Phoenix costume. Maybe the White Phoenix costume. I'm curious to see where everything is going to go. But again, like we saw in X-Men Forever that the Phoenix is bleeding out of Jean and they're in snow. So... You know, that's are we going to get another the Phoenix is in peril sort of story? I mean, we're kind of going through the motions now. Jean just died in the Hellfire Gala. She's struggling to come back together. So she's going to come back together and then be defeated in Rise and Fall. And then we're going to get X-Men Forever sort of grappling with that. I don't know. Let's see where it all goes. But it is very promising. Our God Queen is front and center. I hope these stories go somewhere big and epic. We already know that X-Men Forever is going to talk about the mutants coming back. So we kind of already got spoiled with that from the Marvel press release, <laughs> you know, where they were like, you have ans you have questions since Immortal X-Men finished. And we're like, no, we don't have any questions because the series is still going on. But I guess we will have questions. So let's see where it goes. You know, I really do hope that the X-Men get a very successful reboot. I hope everyone are, is still continuing to be a Wednesday warrior and going to pick up the books. You know, I think it's easy for me right now to be engaged with the books with Fall of X because there's so much happening with Gene. But, you know, contrary to Justice Channel, I am a bigger fan of a lot of other characters, but I find it really hard to digest the books and, and feel that Fall of X and Rise and Fall are going to be worth my time. And, you know, I, I'm curious about X-Men Forever, but there's so much being thrown right now to us as just readers. I mean, we're supposed to get a tease for a new X-Men team. It, it's already November 22nd. Where Where is that tease for the new X-Men team that we were told we were going to get? I One more week to tease us. I guess maybe in something in the books next week will allude to a new X-Men team. You, know, you remember at San Diego Comic-Con, they released a logo called New X-Men, and it was in the Age of Apocalypse font. So let's see where all of it's going to go. But again, there's so much being thrown at us that it's almost kind of like whoa wait regroup get get us hype there was genuine hype for the x-men after x-men disassembled and when we got hickman there was genuine hype with grant morrison's new x-men there was genuine hype for messiah complex you have to work for these kind of things you can't just keep throwing things at us um as readers but anyways familia what did you guys think think of immortal x-men number 17 again don't let don't let my deep analysis throw anyone off i am very excited to see where it where everything's going with our god queen i cannot wait to see what's happening drop your feels in the comments below dm us at power of x-men if you're at la comic-con december 1st through the 3rd swing by our panel we're gonna have a panel on december 3rd and in conversation with Lenore Zan from 
X-Men, the anime series, and X-Men 97. She was the voice of Rogue. She is a good friend of our podcast. Today is her birthday. Go wish her a happy birthday on Instagram at Lenore Zan. We will be at her booth as well. I'll sort of be there doing some social media with her. And we have the Hellfire Gala Walk, which I will be streaming from the Power of X-Men Instagram page. And Michelle Waffle is one of the co-organizers for that, along with Jordan, the girl with the great smile. They built a large Krakoan gate. Oh, it's going to be so much fun, family. I cannot wait. Drop your feels on the comments below. Let's have a conversation as a community, and we'll see you next time.